Thanks, Denise. Um, I have to admit, I'm pretty nervous speaking in such illustrious company. Oh, wow. <laughs> But I'll do my best. Um, I, I was delighted to see that Alan showed this picture of the MIT Building 20 and talked about how it was meant to be a temporary building, yeah. which reminded me of where I met Jane, which was in the so-called transient building yeah. <laughs> at Sydney University, which was anything but. Um, and one thing that Jane really taught me to do was to uh, be rigorous and to try and express things explicitly and using formal methods where possible. Um, but despite that training, I find myself constantly doing the opposite, which is to seek functional explanations, uh, something that she tried to beat out of me, but hasn't succeeded. So this is gonna be another example of that, I'm afraid. So what I'm going to be talking about is a problem in morphology. And as we all know, Jane loves morphological problems. Um, this is a long-standing one, and it's one that is not restricted to Australian languages. It's found in many languages of the world, um, in various parts. And it's the problem of the existence of portmanteaus in particular parts of person paraphrase, which is what I'm going to be talking about. So as Yvonne famously said, paraphrasing podge if today is found more things in yesterday's lexical words than today's morphology is just that syntax, which sounds simple. Um, the problem is getting from one point to the other point um, doesn't always turn out to be particularly easy to explain. And so one thing that Jane maybe observed once, we can't actually remember each of us, is that there don't seem to be any languages that have a system of independent pronouns that combine two arguments into a portmanteau form. Um, although Warren Wool, the you know, language one of the languages that Jane worked on <coughs> extensively, has something like that. But portmanteaus of that kind are rife in the prefixing agreement systems of NPN languages in Northern Australia. They're the typical expression in particular parts of the paradigm of a combination of two arguments for the <coughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. And the question is, how do we get those? If those down morphemes come from a former system of, let's say, politicized agreement markers, um, at, what, at what point did we get portmanteaus turning up in those systems? And spoiler, I don't know, but I'm going to make some suggestions that may be relevant to understanding how they require. So here's a portion of an Alakan prefixing system. Note that I'm not using orthography in this talk, I'm using IPA. So J means about of Y. Um, and then this illustrates the kind of problem I'm talking about. So in most of the Alakan agreement paradigm, where you've got at least one argument that's third person, it's not too hard to associate one part of the prefix complex with a particular um, person number category. So if we look at the combinations with third singular object, for instance, it's not too hard to figure out that um, since third singular object is zero, that you know, what's left is the expression of those person number categories on the left here, number of uh, flavoring, labeling with rows. Um, and similarly, when you've got a third singular subject, um, what you have in the in the prefix complex, something that corresponds to the person number categories of the object plus this marker at the end that tells you that its function is an object rather than a subject. And that difference between um, alveolar and retroflex is a, is a regular alternation. It's not, you know, it's not a weirdness in there. It's completely predictable. But if you look at combinations of second person and first, person arguments, like we have up here in this quadrant, you get prefixes that can't easily be divided into their component parts. Um, and in particular, uh, this form, Juan, that marks second person singular subject with first singular object, even though it looks a little bit like, well, it has a component of the second singular agent marker, Juan, but it doesn't make any sense to have this N here at the end of it, which normally marks objects and certainly doesn't have that function in that form. And there's no obvious expression of the first person category in this um, prefix. So 
Prefixes, that's what I mean by a portmanteau prefix, something that can't easily be divided into its component parts, parts that are um, recognizable in other parts of the prefix and paradigm. And portmanteaus like these are found in the majority of prefixing from Dominion languages. There you get the arguments um, adjacent to each other in the string on the same side of the word. You don't get them in languages like Neil Mullen, where you've got a subject marker on one side and object marker on the other side. But you also get them in languages of the Americas and PNG, for instance. So this is not just something restricted to Australia. And in all of those cases, it's you get them in those kinds of categories. So um, the question is, how did we get to this kind of system um, from what we think might have happened in the development of those languages from a more ancestral language? So Mark and Rob, for instance, have suggested following um, work by David Osseby that the Proto Australian might have been a language a lot like Walbury, a language that Jane worked on, just to you know, keep stressing that this is a a talk in honor of Jane, but it had a phonetic system that combines pronouns, found pronouns, and model of sense information like that was already we've got there. But characteristically, those kinds of phonetic systems don't have portmanteaus uh, where we get them in prefixing systems, with the possible and partial exception of Warren. I haven't found any other Australian clear systems that have that kind of characteristic portmanteau in that part of the paradigm, whereas they're absolutely typical in prefixing systems. There are other differences as well between these two kinds of systems. So, uh, phonetic systems often have more than two arguments. Uh, prefixes, prefixing systems don't do that. Um, you also get syncretism of person categories quite commonly in prefixing systems in the same kinds of parts of the paradigm that you get portmanteaus. So that's often um, a way of dealing with what I'm going to talk about is a kind of conflict of uh, motivations in that part of the paradigm, whereas you don't get that in prefix systems. You do get uh, syncretism of number, but not person. And you also get um, differences in the use of duplicatives, which I'm not going to talk about. Hierarchical ordering is common to both those kinds of systems, and it's useful to use these kinds of terms to distinguish those different kinds of configurations of arguments. So this is taken from the American structuralist tradition that started with Sapir, I guess, um, looking at Algonquian languages. And so a direct system is one where a speech act participant, so a first or second person argument is in subject role and the uh, object is expressed by a third person category. He, an inverse system is the opposite of that. So the SAP argument is an object role and the third person argument is a subject role. The ones that we're interested in here are the local categories, the local configuration, which involves two arguments, both from the um, speech act participant part of the paradigm. And that's where we find portmanteaus in Australian and international affixal agreement systems. What is special about that particular combination of arguments? So firstly, I'm going to make the observation that combinations of two speech act participant arguments are reasonably uncommon in discourse. Now, ideally, we'd like to show that with a nice big corpus of spoken dialogic indigenous language. We don't really have anything like that in Australia at this point. Um, we have corpora that include dialogues in them, conversations, but they're usually not the major component of the corpus. Most of our corpora are either solidly monologic or mostly monologic. And those tend to have only first or, first or third person arguments, um, unless there's reported speech in the corpus. Uh, we'll look at some corpora on indigenous languages in a minute. But I'm going to start with English. And in English, what we find is patterns like these. So looking at the International Corpus of English New Zealand, which has 
uh, two components of dialogue in it uh, from 104,000 lines of text, we find just 39 instances of E in the same clause as U. Um, and that's, you know, after pulling out combinations of me and you and actually going through them and eyeballing them to check that they were actually arguments for the same verb. <laughs> um, 28 of those 39 were occurrences of me in direct object function. 11 occurrences um, were me in dative function with those like it or bring and so on. And a significant number of those instances of e in either object or data function occur in non assertive contexts. So, hypothetical situations, modal contexts, and lots of interrogatives. And so, the takeaway here is that lots of combinations of second singular subject with first singular object are non assertive. Um, and as Alana and Mark pointed out to me, that makes a lot of sense. It seemed it would be odd. For the speaker to assert knowledge on part of the hearer. And so it, it's natural that you get non assertive uh, context with all those combinations. That is also true of uh, combinations of first person singular subject followed by uh, with a second person object. I can't tell if it's singular or in English without looking at the context. Um, there's, you know, those are also infrequent. There are only 83 combinations in that corpus. Um, 30 of the subjects, 30 of the instances of you were subjects of complement clauses. So I want you to, or I think you should, or I asked you to. Um, there were 33 dative objects um, and 20 direct objects of words like love, kill, I understand. So a lot of combinations of first singular and second singular don't encode straightforward transitive events. They um, have a majority of either ditransitives or complement clause constructions. If we compare the results of those grounds in combination with another speech act participant argument, we can see that the, um, the numbers are, are quite tiny in comparison to the use overall in the corpus. And so, um, whereas those pronouns both have a frequency of around 50,000 per million, that's the standard count for a corpus, um, it's past per million, 50 or 70,000 per million. <laughs> but in combination with each other, they range somewhere between 400 and 800 per million. So that's 0.04 to 0.08%. Hopefully, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, which is a lot less frequent than their combinations independently. So the U um, followed by me configurations tend to occur in non-assertive contexts, and the IU configurations tend to occur in ditransitives and complement clauses. Um, and this is a similar result from a different corpus um, where we get combinations of um, two local arguments, and you're getting three percent. So this is three percent of of clauses involving only pronominal arguments. So it's still a, a small fraction of agreement overall. Now let's go to indigenous languages. If we look at the Warboy corpus, the Jeff Heap collected, uh, that contains around 67,000 words. We're able to do this work now because of the efforts of Nick Teberger up there and Simon Munsgrove at Monash University together with some research assistants that we both were involved in. And so we can say that there are 8,600 predicates, and so there's 8,600 instances of agreement. Only 18 of those, as far as I can tell, involve examples of the local configuration, despite there being 400 examples of you in translations of the text. So that's 0.2% of the total agreement forms you know, on the assumption that all of these predicates involve some kind of agreement, which they do. Uh, forbidding the walk. Um, we've got Alex Marley's work on the Bidding with Walk Corpus. Um, she doesn't actually report this in her thesis, but this was something that she very graciously went and investigated and dug out for me, uh, which I'm very grateful. <laughs> the computer's telling me that someone's playing music. <laughs> um, and based on what Alex was able to pull out, we can show that combinations of first and second person 
uh, 0.5 percent combination of the second person subject with first person object one percent of the pool. So again, and this is percentages of all the grant forms in the database. So again, very small numbers. And this is a corpus that does involve some um, components of conversation. So in um, old parlance, we could say that local configurations are marked with respect to the other combinations of arguments in the green paradigms. In particular, the direct and equipollent uh, configurations involving third person objects. And um, in hierarchical agreement systems like the ones that we find in um, many clinic bound parallel systems, as well as affixal agreement systems, we have uh, a preference for topic first, what's been argued for topic first. We have speech act participants who assumed to be topical by definition and thus outrank third person arguments. So the hierarchical agreement system is um, organized on that basis that SAPs. Um, outrank third person, and so they either precede third person in a prefixal system, or they are expressed um, in preference to third person arguments altogether in systems like that. So local configurations present two sources of conflict. One is that we've got two arguments competing for a single topic slot, uh, we could think of it as, and we have configurations where both arguments are speech act participants but where one of them is the speech act participant in object function, which is a dispreferred association between um, role and reference. And we don't know very much about uh, processing in languages like this, but there's evidence that suggests that speakers retrieve and plan both clinic clusters and prefix or agreement as a block separately from what proceeds or follows because of the distribution of clauses on either side of these strings, in both prefixing languages and in clinic agreement systems, at least from what I've been able to find in the literature, for some languages at least. Um, what we know about processing morphology is that frequency plays a role in retrieval, particularly for a regular morphology, more infrequent and more slowly accessed. Um, we also have evidence from uh, neuro, neuroscientific examinations of uh, morphology processing by people like Paul Kessel Shlazewski, showing that if you have a dispreferred, um, a sort of dispreferred correlation between argument role and referential category, you get processing problems, um, which are realized in things like so called mismatch negativity response. And so I propose that some vague confluence of factors like these led to a situation like we see today in prefix and prefix. So the local configurations were infrequent. They conflicted with preferred argument role to uh, person mappings or possibly subject to memory recall issues. And those factors apparently led to rapid turnover in some cases to short-lived solutions, I'm suggesting, and a good deal of inter-speaker variation. And you can get a good deal, a uh, good idea of the variation that you get in synchronic prefixing systems from looking at Alex's thesis, for instance. But it's not just limited to these uh, combinations I should add. So one very widespread solution is to simply admit one of the arguments, typically the subject. And in this situation, the speech act participant subject is often formally equivalent to a third person, to a combination with a third person singular subject, which is to say that there's no overt realization of subject at all. So, in these examples from Ryan Prestons, um, another one of the languages that Francesca worked on, of course, we've got uh, the same prefix used for first singular objects in combination with either a second or a third person subject, which means that you've got a neutralization of person there. and in essence, all you're marking is the fact that the first person is an object, you're not saying anything else about who the subject is. And this is a very widespread solution. You get it in all these languages I listed at the bottom there, and possibly others as well. So this is somewhat reminiscent of a passive construction, and it has a similar effect of promoting the object to topic while demoting the agent. Um, it's not a passive, of course, it has differences to a passive. 
But in this respect, we're approaching his explanation for like a configuration for Pentos, which is what he calls phenomenal disguise. And the idea was that speakers maybe actively attempt to obscure the referential features of the arguments in the local congregation because they're face threatening. The problem with that explanation is, um, as Nick Evans reminded me, it never applies in the case of independent pronouns. Um, so as far as I know, um, there are no straight languages where independent pronouns are subject to the same kind of obscuring effects that um, JP is proposing. And indeed, in some, in some cases, speakers need to supply an overt independent pronoun to disambiguate prefixes which are uh, multiply ambiguous, as in this other example from Alex's thesis, we've got the prefix kundi, which sympathizes over all of those combinations of arguments, um, where one just means first person, doesn't tell you whether it's singular or plural. And we get the first person single, uh, over pronoun turning out. I've been told to stop. Um, so let's stop. Not instantly. <laughs> Please. Uh, so in some cases, you get, I said there were cases of rapid turnover. What I wanted to say here was that um, the, you often find that, well, you sometimes find at least that neighboring very closely related languages like these two, Rabat and Alakar, which have a reconstructable prefix system, um, the, the reconstruction falls apart just in the local configuration of prefixes. And it's there that you find difficulties in finding um, forms that you can reconstruct. You can reconstruct some of it, um, and some of it seems to go possibly a long way back. So this prefix jun, which is cognate with Rambanga done um, with uh, regular sound changes involved in, in that correspondence. There's something very similar that turns up in Aranya, for instance, in the same position in Kara, which is a striking, though possibly uh, coincidental correspondence. Um, but in other cases, it's very difficult to, to figure out what's been going on. Here, for example, it looks like Rambaranga has just um, created new forms that follow the pattern of the rest of the paradigm, whereas Nalakan has this inexplicable prefix Nugul, which doesn't look like anything else, um, except it looks a bit like the second person um, dative pronoun, dative clitic pronoun, which is a bit different in, in Nalakan, it's Nungure, Nungure, but in neighboring languages, it doesn't involve a nasal stop cluster there. So in Nandi's um, and we see other examples of the use of data pronouns in this particular part of the paradigm as well, which I don't have time to go through. Um, the one to two category is quite different. We so we see the structural replacement that I've talked about and the static clinic. If we look a bit more further afield at Nandi and Woodboy, for instance, it becomes very difficult to reconstruct what's happened here, um, what the source of many of these forms is. There's one form that we can compare between the two languages, um, but it has a different reference in each one. So it's a second person singular object in Nandi, but a second dual object in Woolboy, just in the realis part of the paradigm. Many of these other forms um, don't find any obvious source, particularly the ones down here. Um, this Gura, Prefix I'm suggesting maybe comes from the same source as Nalakan Nugu. It's so from the day of clinic uh, pronoun Nugu A with um, deletion of the initial syllable. But again, that's speculative. Um, and a lot of these other forms we just can't reconstruct. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting that the that the uh, realis realis contrast is neutralized just in the combination of second person subject and first person object, um, and that kind of makes sense given what we found about the context in which those combinations occur in discourse, which is that they tend to be non-assertive. Um, and so the forms that we get here in Wuboy, we can't exactly reconstruct what this is, but it looks like other irrealis prefixes in Wuboy. 
Really stop. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we don't find anything like this among bound thirty systems, except for Warrenwool. But the Warrenwool report answers are not what we'd expect them to be. Um, <coughs> And presumably the factors motivating development of portmanteaus in advertising systems are largely the same. So what is the difference? Um, I don't really have an answer there. Um, all I can say is that since we find similar kinds of things in other languages around the world, we need an explanation that is, is something that we can apply generally. It has to be a general explanation. It can't be a parochial explanation that's specific to particular cultures or to specific um, language groups. And I suggested that it's a combination of various factors, combination of preferred structures and discourse leading processing problems, the factor of infrequency, and a particular context in which local configurations are found that may be part of the explanation. Um, and that's it. So now I'm stopping. <laughs>